never changes. Welcome back. Dying that guy. I'm Wes Chatham. This is my good buddy Ty Frank, who is, who is an OG gamer, who's been gaming before gaming was cool. <laughs> Wait, you, what is the first, was it the Atari? No, no, there's stuff before. So I, I actually did play the first video game ever created, which was called Space War. It ran on a mainframe. Uh, I played that at the community college uh, in the town I lived in, and that was the very first video game. Before you go, how did you even know about the game, and then did you get your parents to drive you to the community college just to play the game? Yeah. And how did you know about it? Um, I, I think I saw something about it on TV. I don't remember how I came to be aware of it, but I was like so fascinated by it. it, Cause it was just, it was, it was like, yeah, there it is. Oh, wow. Wait, is that a computer console? I mean, meaning like, was it like, it wasn't like a game you run on a computer like that, like that you had to get that whole fucking thing. Like, it actually, it actually ran on a mainframe. Um, Oh, okay. So it ran on like the big, the big old uh, computers. It did not look this good. The, the version I played did not look this. Was it anyway. fun? Yeah, because, you know, it was basically asteroids, but without any asteroids. Mm-hmm. Except there was just two ships. There was a ship that looked like the asteroid ship, which was like the little wedge. Mm-hmm. And then there was a ship that looked like line art of the Enterprise. It was like a little circle with two little lines poking out the back. And oh, wow. all you did was you fly, flew around and tried to shoot each other. That was it. That was the whole game. Was it a two-player game or was yeah. it you fighting the computer? Um, and then, it was two player. And then uh, what year was that? Uh, that was when I played it. It would have been late 70s, early 80s. And so when you heard about this game and you went and played it, were you hooked right away? Or was it you didn't? Oh, I, something... I would have stayed there all day. Oh, and wow. Just played the, yeah, like if they had let me keep playing with it, I would have just stayed there all day playing with that. Yeah. Oh, um, and then, so then, I'm. Re- this is fascinating to me here in this first game, but a little bit. And we're we're talking about Fallout today, so I want to get, I want to show you how bona fide our expert is here at this podcast to talk about a video game turned TV show. Um, but what was the next step into that? So in the in the early '80s, Sears was selling this. Remember the Pong console? Did you ever see one of those? Um, so so Pong had shown up at. Uh, you could play it like at bars. There was like an actual Pong uh, console game, or not console, but like upright console that you could play. If you, it, it, I think it was only at bars that they had them. Um, and then somebody made a home console for Pong, and it was just like it was like an Atari. You like plugged it into your TV. Um, you didn't even plug it in. It had like you 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 know where the the VHF antenna like you screwed the screws to hook the wires. In the back of the mm-hmm. TV, yeah, this had yeah, like a little yeah. box that uh-huh. you would hang on the back of the TV that you screwed into there, and then there was like uh-huh. a switch to switch from like antenna to game. That is That's how old this yeah. shit was. It, but you could play Pong, but it wasn't just Pong. It was like a bunch. It was like eight different Pong games, right? Right. But it was all this. It was all just the paddle moving around and the ball bouncing around, but different versions of that. Right. We had that. We had the first one of those. And then, of course, I was around for the Atari 2600, which took the world by storm. The first computer I ever owned was a Commodore 64, which still to this day is the world record holder for the platform with the most game titles in history. The Commodore 64 had tens of thousands of game titles for it. Wait, which, C- Commodore 64 was post Atari? Yeah. Yeah. So it was like the next evolution of Atari? I mean, it was, just, I, it was, it was, it was one of the inexpensive at-home computer options so there was the commodore 64 there was atari had a a competing computer i don't remember what it was called and then the ibm had the trs 80 which was like you could get it like radio shack everybody called the trash 80 it was like the it was their at home computer oh and then there was and then apple had uh, a really early early computer as well that but but the commodore 64 was better if you're a gamer because it had 16 colors, which all the other computers at the time didn't have 16 colors. Uh-huh. So the games looked better because they were in 16 colors. And were the it games just had, fun? Uh, yeah. I mean, at the time, sure. I mean, there was, was there so a, many different ones. Though. Was there a gaming culture then like there is now? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? So, like, uh, but, you it had your more, own... but it was more nerds because it was. So you got to remember, this is back when 
getting a game to run on your computer could be a programming challenge in itself. It, you know, nowadays we're used to like you, you buy a game and you just download it onto your Xbox or your PlayStation and it just instant, instantly works. You don't have to change settings or anything. This right. was the days when like you might have to figure some shit out to get this game to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I missed that one because I'd just be not playing games. But yeah. wait, so but, but, explain but this. It to- was kind of a nerd culture. It was like the tech geeks, right? Yeah. And one of the things that they all did is they all traded games. So you'd have your mm-hmm. floppy disks with your games on it and you'd be like, I've played this one, I'm done with it. You go to school and your friend would have a game and you trade. So they so everybody got to play way more games that way. Uh, was the Commodore 64, was that a computer? And then you played games on the computer? Yes. Or was that like specifically it was a designed for... Okay. It was a computer. It, yeah. Oh, and fascinating. And you got one. Yeah, I got, I got one of the very first ones. Yep. What's interesting is that... Uh, I, so I was at the, um, when I started like being conscious, I was at the, uh, tail end of the, uh, like the first game I ever really had and played was the Nintendo. And I remember when that came out and, you know, I was obsessed for a while, but how did you first, when did you first play fallout and what was in, in, you know, I, there's a guy that I, I trained with over here who was like a big, massive gamer to the point where he was. He thought about like he was professional in right. in high school. Like he would go to these competitions and right. do all these things. And he, he, the way he talks about games, is like how you would talk about sports. Like he was like a video game athlete, and he was obsessed with it. Right. And Fallout's one of his favorite games. He said, uh, "What th- th- there was like a, a name, like another name, but it was part of the Fallout universe." So I was just about to say. So th- I when I played Fallout the first time, it wasn't called Fallout. So this oh. is back in the Commodore 64 days. There was a game uh. that came out called Wasteland. Wait, so this company was making uh, games back then in the Commodore 64 no, games? No, so, so it, it, it's, not that, it's not nearly that straight of a line. Okay. Um, so there was a game that came out in the 80s called Wasteland, and it was, it was a top-down RPG. So you like move a little guy around on the screen, and then you would get in fights and when you got in fights, it would switch to like a text thing where it would show a little window of the thing you were fighting and then the text of what you were doing. Like you were shooting your machine gun at a mutant mole rat and it would tell you how much damage you did, that kind of stuff. So I was playing Wasteland on my Commodore 64 when it first came out. And at the time, it was absolutely one of my favorite games of all time. Like it's so well written. Uh, it's it's at, for the time, for the low technology that we had available to us, it was an amazing game. Then, many years later, um, I hear that they're making a successor to Wasteland. And the, and the company that's making it is a company I really respected as a game development company. And they were clearly big Wasteland fans and, and had the buy-in from the people who had created the original Wasteland. But they decided not to call it Wasteland. They decided to call it Fallout. And so the first Fallout game was basically Wasteland, but or a modern era using modern graphics and modern game styles and stuff. Um, so that I, I played that one too. And the first fallout is amazing. It's a great game. It's, it's uh, sort of that, that two and a half D isometric kind of thing. Um, much better graphics, obviously than the Commodore 64 wasteland way back in the day, all of that, but it was, it's a fantastic game. And, when, and they've been making year, Fallout games ever since. Like, what, what time period was that around when the, when uh, the first Fallout, Fallout came, came out? I would guess in the, um, I couldn't remember what year, but yeah, it was, it was, I guess, late 90s. It must have been a good game because if you, because you have reverence for Wasteland. Yeah. And I know you, when you like something and there's a sequel to it, and if especially if it's a different kind of guy, like, it's got to be special for you to, like, honor it. It has to be worthy. But, it yeah. has to be and, worthy and, of the original. <laughs> and and you it was worthy and then some? Oh yeah. And and so the quote I started the podcast off with the war never changes. That is the opening line that you hear when you start the first Fallout game. And it's spoken by your friend and mine, Ron Perlman. So no. so yeah, so you fire up the game. You're you know, you're watching this like intro movie to the game and Ron Perlman's amazing growly voice comes on. War never changes. And then goes really? into the game. You're fucking in at that point. It's better than a fucking text crawl. 
All I need, all I need is some wasteland looking shit and Ron Perlman saying war never changes. And I'm, I think I'm you, in. I'm in the mood. I think when we had him on the podcast, I think, did you mention this? Yeah. Him or no? I, you did. I okay. Did. Okay. I cool. probably did. I don't remember, but I, I because this was before Hellboy and all that. Oh, you yeah. Know? Yeah. This was, yeah. uh, this would have been, I think the most famous thing he had done at this point was probably Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and Linda Hamilton. Yeah. So, so then what was the evolution from that point going? Was it the same company at that point? Like in so, fallout? So, yeah. So they, they made fallout, then they made fallout two, which again, and was did that, they win like all the awards, all the video game? Yeah, awards I mean, the, and, the first fallout was, was incredibly successful as a game. They made fallout two, which was again, that two and a half D isometric kind of uh, game. Then years went by and, uh, you know, there had always been rumors that there would be a fallout three, um, but it never came out. And then after a bunch of years had gone by and now we're at, now we're at the console. This was still all the PC age. Like I played fallout and fallout two on a, on a PC. Then, you know, you get to like the Xbox and PlayStation age and even more in the console age. And then they announced fallout three is coming out. And now it is, uh, like a first and third person shooter. It's not isometric two two and FD kind of play. And I was pretty skeptical. I was pretty fucking skeptical of this game. But I got it. I put. I think I played it on my Xbox uh, the first time I played Fallout Three. I think it was on Xbox. I'm trying to remember. Um, but it was. It again. It was worthy. It was a worthy successor. Uh, like I. I was like. They kept. They. They kept changing. The. The technology and the style of play for the for the Fallout games, the wasteland of Fallout games, and each time they did, they found a way to make it good again. So I would say that Fallout and Wasteland is one of the most consistently good game series maybe ever um i mean there are people who would argue halo's up there but i halo lost me after halo 3 i i, I think it, it got dumber and dumber as it went there there, there are people who would make that argument about there are some other game series out there that people would make that argument about but I, for me i think wasteland and fallout has been really consistently interesting for gosh what are we coming up on 40 years now so what what do you think? I'm I'm fascinated by this because uh, my friend that I was saying earlier when we were talking about Fallout today, he's he he's a, he. This is one of his favorite games of all time. He's ecstatic about it. What separates a game? Like what makes a game special? Like is it the story? Is it how how does a game become so great like that? Well, so uh, yes, it's story. You know you know that. I mean, we're both the reason we keep talking to each other is because we're both such story freaks. That's, oh, I thought it was because you admire and respect me, and, and it's I I, I it. and I assume it's because you think I secretly have a vagina. <laughs> Based no, on our I, last I, podcast, I, no. But here's the thing: of course, it's a story. I mean, it's yeah. a story. Like for us, we're but, compelled but and everything by stories. But it, there's but there's great story in in there could be great story in a video game, but there's other things that could fall short. That is absolutely true. But you, you got to remember: so in the '80s, when when Wasteland came out. It was hard to tell a good story in video games. The technology didn't exist. So they, they always had to find workarounds. So like some of my favorite games of the period, uh, like I was a big Bard's Tale fan. Nobody would argue Bard's Tale had a great story. It was basically you make a party of adventurers, you walk around this one city, kicking indoors and fighting monsters and raising your stats and getting better gear. There is, I guess, a story in the background, but it's, it, nobody would call it a compelling story. Wasteland found a way to have a compelling story where you actually had real in-game moral questions that you were answering with your actions and, and real moral quandaries in the, in mm -hmm. the setting. And part of it was the setting. It was, this, it was this radioactive wasteland future of our world. So you, did, you weren't in some fantasy world where dragons and elves and magic exist. You were in our world. And... Mm -hmm. and the, it, the consequences you were dealing with as a character were the consequences of a global nuclear war, which in the 80s was on everybody's mind, right? Mm -hmm. It was the 80s. It was the middle. It was the height of the Cold War. Everybody thought we were all going to die of a nuclear war at some point. So this is a game that takes place after that. And they found a way to tell a really compelling narrative in that setting. In the pilot. Uh, the oh, so we're switching now to the show. Well, we don't. We, I, yeah, was, I was trying that, to do it. I was trying to do it seamlessly. I don't want yeah, people no, to see. I, yeah. Um, no, no, no seamless. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was trying to seamless, but in the pilot, uh, so I didn't know anything about the game. I didn't, and I knew 
uh, like I, what I what I really enjoyed when we did Last of Us, I really enjoyed you knowing so much about the game and then explaining to me how the show is the same or how it's different. And so with Fallout, n- knowing how uh, m- how crazy people are about the game and how much they love it, I know there was a lot of pressure on this pilot that was Absolutely. coming out. And we'll talk about the rest of the series later, but I'm just curious, what was your thoughts, your initial impression when you saw the pilot? Well, the 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 trickiest thing to do with Fallout, because because one of the things that changed when it became, when it switched from being Wasteland to being Fallout, is Fallout introduced this this darkly humorous tone to the series. So Wasteland had some jokes in it, it had some some funniness in it, um, and it was it was Wasteland was famous for telling jokes out of horror, out of horrible situations, but Fallout introduced the idea of the pit boy and and you know those like wrist things they wear are called pit boys and there's like the little fallout guy and he's like he's like the guy who's giving you the thumbs up and saying here's how you survive in the wasteland but it's of like a funny little cartoon character mm-hmm. um the fallout games sort of introduced that that element mm-hmm. of it and so mm-hmm. because of that there's this weird mix in the fallout games of dark humor and horror because mm-hmm. it, the, everything in the world is horror Right. It's mm-hmm. like there's flesh eating radioactive, you know, zombies and mutants and and everybody who lives outside the vaults is dying of radiation poisoning and all of that stuff. But there's these funny little cartoon guys that tell you how to survive in the wasteland. And and so that mix of tones is very, I think, what Fallout became is that mix right. of tones to get a Fallout show to work. You have to figure out how to use that tone. Mm-hmm. And I think the the most successful thing the pilot does is it nails that tone, right? The people who because because the other thing that's true of Fallout and was it was true of Wasteland too is it takes it's an alternate history because it splits off from horror fi- history in the fifties, sixties. Mm-hmm. No, it's in the in the games. It's the fifties, and, well, and 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 in the pilot. You know, like the the TV and the shows that were on, and the, it, it, I got the '60s. It, no, anyway, there was a very ahead. '60s vibe to the pilot. But what I'm saying yeah. is, in the game, the, like there is a '50s version of super advanced technology. Mm-hmm. It's like that. Uh, what people in the '50s thought future tech would look like is what all the future mm-hmm. tech in the game looked like. Right? Yeah, I love it. I love it when they do that. I love yeah when movies or TV they do what what we thought in the fifties yeah. was going to be the future. Yeah. It's that, it's that whole sky captain in the world of tomorrow thing, right? It's the, yeah. this is what the fifties thought sci-fi movies would look like. Um, right. But what they nail is that they nail that sort of, it's, it's this late fifties, early sixties sort of, Hey, it's, uh, it, it, everything's going to be awesome. We're, you know, we're white people in America and everything will be great for us. It's that sort of chipper, upbeat sort of version of what the future was going to be that everybody thought right. in the late fifties and early sixties, and right. and contrasting that with the horrors outside and the way they do that in the game and they also do it in the show is all of those people, all of the the rich people who thought everything was going to be awesome for them, they all moved into the vaults, mm-hmm. so they didn't suffer from radiation poisoning. They didn't become flesh eating mutants. They they're living in a vault in a fake version of what they thought the future was going to be right so it's this artificial construct of the future that the vault dwellers created for themselves yeah i thought the tone was fascinating because the contrast between the music and the visuals and the dress and everything with with what was actually going on uh was really compelling the opening of this is one of the most compelling openings of a pilot i've seen in a long time and I was just riveted. Um, and the the way it played out with Walter Goggins. Yeah. Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins. And, yeah. And, 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 then you're and like, his daughter at that party. Yeah. And yeah. what were they? So was he like uh, like Roy Rogers or something? And then now he's doing yeah, uh, birthdays? I, the, 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 the sense I got was that he was a guy who had been a, uh, a movie star or TV star in the 50s in cowboy shows. Right. And some and and I got the sense that he is his career had been destroyed by Huack because he, he seemed like one of those guys who had been blacklisted. And so now he was making a living um, doing birthday parties for rich kids. Yeah, because right? they called him a pinko. 
Yes, you know? they call him a pinko, which is which right. is the one clue that I yeah. picked up on. That I'm like, oh, this this is a guy who got taken out by Huac. Because I was trying to understand, like, wait, this guy was a movie star and he's doing movies, and there was something so sad, so yeah. uh, you know, his relationship to his maintaining his dig- dignity in front of his daughter, and yeah. they're like, hey, can you give him the thumbs up? And he was like, I, you know, and considering what's happening right now, so you see that he has principles, that he stands for something, and that. And whatever that thing is he stood for is probably why he's in this position now. Yeah. So to go from being a real star into doing birthday parties and then the Dude, guy, you're going to you know, wind call, up doing birthday parties. You know that, right? That's the saddest thing you've ever told me on the podcast. <laughs> like, that is fucking, but it'll no, be my I'm, birthday party. So yeah, I'll do your birthday party. Yeah. Or, or it's like, you no, know, I know what you mean. It's like when, uh, when you two plays like the, uh, the sheiks. Yeah birthday parties or something yeah. like that yeah okay maybe i'll do that you know uh but when he's doing these uh these uh the the birthday party and he calls him a pinko then it's like oh because you know this is the 60s and then you know just after the mccarthyism and maybe that was his fall and that's why he's now driven to do these things and the god that's so sad and uh and and all of those uh those things and and then i mean i guess this was probably around the bay of pigs times or or around that area and the, all the war shit was trying to penetrate this positive, yep. happy smile. You know, they, they kept turning it off the TV. It was on the radio, turn off the radio, switching this. And it's, it's so much what we're dealing with now. It's like, you know, we're, we're trying like, ah, we're happy, you know, push the, that shit out of the way. Well, that shit will come to bite you in the ass if you don't tune into it eventually. And boy, did it bite them in the ass. And I thought that was so smart with the putting the thumb in front of the, 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 the smoke. And if it's smaller than their run, if it isn't, then you're fucked. Right. And, uh, and then he goes in there to get his little girl a cake. And then pff, the lighting. And then she holds up her thumb. And then this fucking thing like dwarfs. It's like in the news, a mushroom cloud. And they yep. get in the horse. And it's so brilliant. Like, and the, he gets on his horse and he's riding the bow, 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 bow. Just six of them lightening up. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, was that in the game? Was that in the video not, game? None, none of that is in the game. So I, the thing I will say is nothing that's in the show is directly lifted from the game. I think, I think what they did, I think smartly, is they said, what we're going to do is we're going to tell a, a story in the Fallout universe using the sort of visual language of Fallout, but it's not going to be any of the games you've played so far. And I, I think that's really smart. And and I've worked on a couple of uh, game to uh, film adaptations, uh, developing them. And that's the argument I always make is don't try to remake the game. Don't, don't make a TV show of the game. Now, it worked for Last of Us, but Last of Us was basically a TV show in game form. So that one actually worked. But for most games, that's not a good translation. You know, try, trying to turn the game into a TV show is going to make a bad TV show. And, I, and these guys knew that. And they, what they did is they're like, we're telling a story in the Fallout universe. We're going to use all the visual cues of Fallout that if you played the game, you'll recognize this shit. But it's a totally original story with totally original characters. Um, and I think, I think that was a really smart move. It feels, when you're watching that pilot, it feels like Fallout. But it doesn't feel like anything you've seen before. It doesn't feel like something you've already played. So all this stuff with Vault 33 and all that, that has nothing well, to do with the game? All, almost all of the games start with a vault. Because it is a common story thread in, in the Fallout games that you are a vault dweller who has been forced to leave the vault. Right. Um, in the first one, I think, yeah, I, I forget, uh, I think the first one is the one where you leave to find, like your water maker, the water purifier that, that you use is dying, so you have to leave the vault to find a chip that will let the water thing keep working or else everybody in your vault is going to die. I think that's the right. first one. What's uh, interesting about the vault, it, it had a starship trooper kind of tone uh, where the, the kind of the, the comedic with the violence and the yes. shooting the guns and the, uh, and, and I thought what's interesting is when you're watching it, uh, it looks like the 1960s, the best version of that, but there's something different. Cause then they're like, it's all vaulty. So it's like framed. You look out the windows and it's this beautiful sun and all this stuff, but it's like a, like a hard spaceship looking vault steel wall that you're looking through. 
Um, and it's a great little montage that gives you a sense of what living on the vault is. And she well, has and, this and all and everything is a facade. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, a facade. That's the thing is is that sort of, I mean, not to get too far into social commentary, but anybody who thinks that that period was like this this golden age for America is looking at a facade of that period. That it was a very sort of constructed version of that period, like. You know, the, the father knows best era is like, everybody should go back to that. That's when America was great. Like, yeah, if you ignore all the other shit that was going on, that wasn't like middle class white people. <laughs> right. Um, right. And and so it is this the idea of the vault dwellers is these people have constructed a facade of this idea of what the late 50s, early 50s, 60s thought a perfect life was. And they've just wrapped themselves in that facade. And that's mm-hmm. where they live. They live inside of that facade. And when the, the, the Raiders show up and break in, it is, it is literally reality crashing into reality. their constructed exactly. version of, of life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought that was compelling and skillfully done, the whole wedding setup and situation. Yeah. And it was, it's like a horror movie when the young brother sneaks into the other vault and it's all the wheat is destroyed yep. and the whole place has been ravaged and the guy has been, that the one guy with the thing has been eaten yep. and they eat like, and they sew them back up when they're done. So they're just like, you, like he's like the meat freezer and they're eating those things. And uh, the, the little details about the Raiders, you know, how they look, there's just an edge to them, right? Yep. They were different. And with how hungrily they were eating and the food and the thing. And then the violence of it was, it, 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 you know, it, it had like, you know, fork in the eye and like this kind of comedic type. And the music was contrast with this incredibly violent well, and, scene. And that is, and that's very fallout. The, uh, that sort of mix of this darkly humorous with horror is the, is the tone of fallout. And that fifties, that sort of idealized version of what fifties radio music was, is very mm-hmm. fallout. You know, every right. game starts with this sort of like a '50s kind of sounding song, yeah, um, yeah and, and it's so, cheery and happy, cheery you know? and happy, cheery and upbeat. Yeah, uh, so the that is all right. They did all of that right, um, getting that part of the tone right. Uh, the <laughs> I gotta say, my my favorite moment in in the pilot, you know, talking about the the fork in the eye, is when the uh, the pregnant lady with the fork in her eye just starts laying down the law with a machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, fuck, I don't think- I'm like, fuck yeah, lady. Yeah. <laughs> I got a little confused by how that was all resolved. You know, her, fa- her father, you know, became a savage. So did he have some experience with the upper world? Like, is he? They're uh, certainly implying that in the right. Pilot. They are implying and- that there is secret backstory to the Kyle yeah. McLaughlin character that his chickens have come home to roost when those raiders show up to get him, capture him, right? And I thought I really I thought that was interesting because he's like, oh my little my little sugar pops all growing up, and then you know, totally like totally like a sitcom dad in the fifties. Yep. And then he just fucking goes full ham, is like killing people with shovels and and doing everything to save his little girl. So was it ambiguous for a reason? I mean, did I miss something or did they leave unanswered no, questions? I, th- I think I think that is one of the mysteries of the show or at okay. least of this first season of the show. So the standoff yeah. at the end when he was, she was like, choose these people or your daughter. And he takes, so explain to me what that whole situation is. I, honestly, I, I was a little unclear on that myself because what they wind up doing is just taking him. Yeah. So the choose these people, or your daughter thing. I'm not sure what, what the, the thing that they were asking there was or what, what, what the standoff was. Cause they just take him. They don't. Yeah. They don't it, shoot her I, it, it or was, the people, right? It was it it was set up to me in a way that they were they were going to torment him by make giving him a choice. You can save right. your daughter. I'm going to kill all these people, or you choose them. I'm going to kill but her. But then they don't. And then you, but then they don't. Yeah. So it, it is yeah. a weird moment. I'm not sure. Yeah. I understood it 100 percent myself. Right now, the uh, the brotherhood and the those machines, yeah. brotherhood of steel, brotherhood of steel. Is yeah. that a video game? Conceit? It totally is. Yep. The Brotherhood of uh-huh. Steel. So there's, once you get into the Fallout universe and sort of the lore of the universe, there's, there's these factions that are like powerful factions in the world that are trying to reclaim the world. The Brotherhood of Steel is sort of like... Are they world wh- powers? Like, no, they're, it, I mean, they're, they're trying to be. They're trying to reclaim. Like, all of them are trying to like reclaim America 
and like, like people, yeah, that's what I'm at. Like, what yeah. is the arena? Is this North America? That yeah, this is North America. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the picture the Brotherhood of Steel is like, like there's a nuclear war, and all of the people who were in the military form their own faction. So it's the super hardcore military faction of the survivors become the Brotherhood of Steel. And uh, there's, there's some other factions that we haven't really seen yet, but I assume we're going to get to. The Brotherhood of Steel is an important one. Um, the Rangers. So there's this, there's this group in the Southwest that call themselves the Desert Rangers. They become sort of like a roving police force for the Southwest. And in some of the games, you actually play a member of that group of the Desert Rangers. Um, that you're actually a member of the Desert Rangers in the first game in Wasteland. And so that, that's a faction that shows up again. So there's like, and there's political groups as like the, the thing that I don't know if we'll get to it in the, in the show, but, but there's the NCR, which is the new California Republic, which is like California sort of turns into its own little country and starts trying to expand and reconquer the rest of America. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. That I would, that's, I would not be a member of that group. Um, I would, would uh, California's got all the food and the, and the aircraft carriers, man. I want to be on the team that has food and aircraft carriers. No, California is a desert. As soon as <laughs> as soon as you stop pumping in water, well, Southern California, yeah, Los Angeles is a desert. As soon yeah. as they stop shipping in water from other places and draining lakes, California's fucked. Yeah, that is the a entire place. Southwest is from Texas <laughs> yeah. to California and everything yeah. in between. <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh. The, my favorite part of this show is the Walton Goggins. Yeah. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the beginning, but also the fact that he lived for like 217 years. And is this in the video game? Like, is this explained? Is he, is, I know he's a mutant, but do they give him well, they, is he's, it extra he's, long life? He's a, I think I, I don't, I'm not going to state this for certain because they don't actually come out and say it, but I think he's a ghoul. He is a ghoul. It says in the, the heading, ghoul. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So it yeah. does call him a ghoul. Okay. So in yeah. the game, the ghouls are people who have been changed by the radiation so that their, their physiology is different. So like they, they don't, you know, in this case, they're saying that Walton Goggins stopped aging because of mm -hmm. the way the radiation changed him. It also, he seems to be very uh, resistant to physical damage. You know, like mm -hmm. he's very hard to kill, which mm -hmm. I think is, is true to the game with the ghoul. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's, I think that's what they're saying he is, uh, yeah, his nose never, didn't do well, but everything else did. What's that? His nose didn't do well. No, no, because the ghouls, the ghouls look like they're basically zombies living dead. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, that, that whole, that whole thing was really cool. What were they trying to recruit him for? Uh, well, they, they're, they're hunting somebody down. They're hunting down. Oh, I didn't know if this was a video game. No, oh no, no. So, so in the, in the at least in the pilot story, you know, they're 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 hunting for someone, um, and they they think he's you know he's the best. You got to get the best. You need that Blade Runner magic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we need the Blade Runner. Yeah. So yeah, um, and then I, he killed I, them. I think all. that's the idea. Is they're they yeah. they got their little team of desert psychos, and they're gonna they're gonna recruit him to join. And do they, in the game, do they shoot people with, like, baby doll parts? Because they shot that one guy and had, like, a baby doll foot that went through his chest. So is that, like, uh, a... Well, so the, in the later Fallout games, you could actually make weapons out of all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think you could make weapons that fire just random garbage that you found. Yeah. Uh -huh. so that, they, may be, they may be tipping their hat to that. So as a video game fan... Just on the pilot, what were your, what are your reviews? I th I thought the pilot was fantastic. I thought they nailed the tone, which is really hard to do. It's a weird mix of tones. It's that that horror, that dark comedy, and it's really hard to do that without tipping over into slapstick or farce, mm -hmm. which they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a tricky tightrope to walk, and I think they pulled it off. Uh, I really like the main character. I think she's great. Uh, the, the the thing with the the early Fallout games is you're playing a vault dweller who's being forced to leave for the vault for the first time. You don't know shit. You're totally mm -hmm. ignorant of the world outside. You have right. some tools that the vault gave you when you left, and you have whatever right. training you got when you were in the vault. Right. But you're you're as naive as it possible when you walk out because it's this whole world that you didn't even know existed really. Right. Um, and I think she's nailing that tone of yeah, naive. Yeah, she has this 
a dominable spirit. You yeah, know, indomitable that spirit, can't but, be kind of, but mixed with naivete, right? Yes. Naivete. Um, so um, I, I think she's great, and I, and I like that they show that, you know, she's been training all this stuff, but then, so like, you're like, oh, she's been training to be a badass, but then when she gets in the fight with the raider, who is her fake husband, he kicks the shit out of her. It's like, that is what should happen. He's been living in the wasteland his entire life. He's a survivor. He's going to be a bad motherfucker, right? Yeah, but and then she has this strength that has to awaken yes. through the fight, you yes. know? But, uh, you know, uh, Joseph got the patrons together, and we are going to do a top five best video games of all time. Best video games uh, of all time? Well, yeah. I know my number one already. So what's the list, Joseph? <laughs> what are you talking about, dude? I just, I just love oh, this. What? Oh, somebody <laughs> forgot to do the top five? Well, I thought, I thought sorry, we were reviewing sorry, the guys. Mass Effect pilot, well, somebody right? Somebody dropped the ball. Drop the ball. So no, the, in the least <laughs> shocking twist ever, Joseph didn't do his this job. This Joseph guy, he <laughs> yeah, fucking sucks. Job. Yeah. Yeah. We are playing with them uh, Q-tips. <laughs> um, oh, Wow. No, this is going to be the running gag now, isn't it? We Listen, we love Joseph, and <laughs> Joseph loves us. Thank you guys for hanging out. This was uh, fun talking about Fallout. Ty giving us a little video game history. I think it's fascinating. And uh, please like and subscribe. And hopefully we'll come back to finish the whole Fallout series, and then we got to come back for uh, Shogun as well. Yeah, yeah, I need to finish watch. I, I've still got one episode left of Shogun, which I need to finish watching because I really have enjoyed that show. Awesome. Uh, say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.